Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. You, you pretty much noticed that, uh, unfortunately, we had to skip the very last keynote session interview that I was supposed to conduct with Ms. Uh, Damilola Ogumbi, who's the special representative of the UN Secretary General and the CEO for Sustainable Energy for all, but uh, she was going to join us virtually, and as is, I'm sure everyone here in this room has experienced this in one form or another throughout the last uh, two, three years. When it's virtual, unfortunately, sometimes um, things don't function as uh, they were scheduled or planned. So unfortunately, uh, we uh, had to drop it for technical reasons, but nonetheless, that doesn't prevent us from moving along in the program, and we are in the final stretches. And as a matter of fact, this is the very fi final panel uh, of the EIB Group uh, Forum. And to conclude the forum, uh, I'm happy to hand over to the Vice President of the European Investment Bank, Chris Peters, who will be moderating this final round. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is the last session, uh, most important one of the two days, of course. Uh, <laughs> not uh, because the, the team, because uh, Make uh, Europe uh, Stronger is a very important debate, but uh, we have now two very important uh, uh, guests. Uh, first of all, Christian Danielsson uh, is a State Secretary uh, from Sweden, and you know Sweden have, uh, for the moment, uh, the presidency of the European uh, Union, and we have also Johan van Overtveld, who is a uh, chair of uh, the Budget uh, Committee in the European Parliament, but also, of course, member of the European Parliament, and he was, uh, not so long ago, a, a colleague of mine, because he was a Minister of Finance in the government uh, of uh, Belgium. There's uh, very uh, important guests uh, with a very important uh, uh, issue, uh, you know that uh, poly crisis. It was uh, mentioned by my colleagues several times, of course. Uh, energy crisis, uh, climate crisis, uh, and so on. Um, we have also the. Um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, from the United uh, States. And of course, now the main issue is how we can uh, make our uh, companies more competitive and more competitive uh, with the, Euro the European, uh, uh, the United States, and a lot of other uh, companies outside of uh, Europe. Now, that is, of course, a very important. Uh, uh, discussion. Discussion is, is still going on. And uh, if you agree, because we have only 25 minutes, that is a short uh, time. I ask more time, but uh, some uh, people <laughs> must leave uh, and, and catch their airplane. And it's not, uh, I will not be responsible that you uh, cannot catch your airplane. Uh, now, saying this, is, I'll be very uh, short, and I hope uh, also you. Um, what is, uh, as the uh, presidency of the European Union, the, 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 the position um, now to make uh, Europe more competitive than ever before with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and so on, short uh, term and uh, what longer term. Uh, Christian, please, I give you the floor. Our position is strong. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> no, no, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity at the final session. And uh, very happy to see that uh, quite a few are still remaining here, which is, uh, which is uh, a good sign. Now, for us, um, we have put competitiveness very high up on the agenda for our presidency. And uh, the reason is that uh, we believe firmly that uh, even though Europe over the last 10 years, a little bit more, have been very much occupied with, uh, shall we call it, crisis. Financial crisis, migration crisis, COVID coming up, and then the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and done well. We, we need to keep the longer-term issue of competitiveness of the European Union high up on the agenda. And why? Because if we are not able to deliver growth and be better on productivity, where we are lagging behind competitors in the transit on the other side of the Atlantic and in Asia, we are not going to be able to, if, to, to address the major challenges in an efficient way. Climate change, bio, biodiversity, 
environment and the society that we stand for. And that's why we put competitiveness very high up. And what we would like to see coming out of this presidency is that we are getting a understanding and an agenda for how to strengthen European competitiveness in the longer term. And then we talk about the internal market. We talk about a deepening of the capital markets. We talk about trade and seeing too that the trade agenda can move forward. We talk about skills. We talk about innovation. We talk about research. We are today de devoting, uh, in terms of investment in research, substantially lower than what is, de what is devoted by, say, the US or competitors in Asia. We're talking about better regulation, we talk about standardization, all those aspects that we are good at, but where we need to do better. You took up the ERA. ERA, in a sense, it is important. It's a clean tech issue, and we should, in a sense, be welcome that the Americans are back into the Paris Agreement, welcome that they are taking a serious attempt to address the issue of climate change. But there are also, we need to recognize, a need for us to gear up when it comes to clean tech. And, uh, and uh, we will see now what the Commission will present, but it seems to us that the, uh, the idea of a net zero uh, uh, industrial act that's called to provide a better environment for clean tech industry within the EU is probably the right thing to go forward with. We are a bit more skeptical when it comes to issues relating to state aid. State aid is, uh, is, is important from time to time, but we need to see too that it's done in such a way that it doesn't undermine the internal market. And we know that some countries are better seated for state aid than others. There are also a good thing that we should look into skills, which the Commission is taking up in this context, and trade. It should be, not be underestimated the importance where for clean tech industry to have markets beyond the EU market for their development and their competitiveness. So there you have a bit of the agenda that we are looking forward to. And as a presidency, we will take up the issues and work as a presidency in moving it forward. Okay, thank you, Christian. Now, going to the European Parliament, uh, very important, and also, of course, the Commission uh, of, of the Budget, uh, where you are share, Johan. Uh, there is uh, already a discussion, I've understood, in the European Parliament about a review of the multi-annual uh, financial framework. Um, that is uh, something for June, I think, to finalize. Now, the discussion is, do we do we need new instruments? Do we uh, need reinforcing uh, existing uh, instruments or expanding? Um, for the first round, what, what is your opinion uh, about uh, the restoring competitiveness? The same question coming uh, uh, to you uh, as a member of the European Parliament and also the discussion, which kind of instrument do you think uh, we need to restore our competitiveness? Please, Johan. Thank you. Um, we negotiated a new multi-annual financial framework for seven years uh, tw in 2020, which was, of course, before the invasion in Ukraine, before the inflation outburst with everything that that entails in terms of changing the macroeconomic environment. So today, uh, early 23, I think it's fair to conclude that the MFF is already out of date because so much things happened, so much initiatives have been taken, uh, NGEU, uh, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, the Sovereignty Fund that is coming up now. Uh, so I think we need more than just a review of the MFF, we need a revision. That's at least what uh, a rather strong majority in the parliament thinks. Uh, most of us fully understand the political hot potato that this might become, obviously. But on the other hand, if you have a lot of initiatives which are valuable uh, uh, going their course outside of the budget process, then of course the parliament cannot play its role of scrutiny and control, as every parliament should play and also the European parliament. So we'll see what the uh, propositions of the commission uh, will be. They will come up with a proposition by June. That's what I understand from Commissioner Hahn, uh, whether it will be uh, a real uh, revision or a, a review. Now, a thorough review might be close to a revision, so we, it will be some kind of linguistic game. But anyway, uh, we, will, we are looking forward to what the Commission will bring. Now, if you look at the European budget and talk about competitiveness, then of course you cannot escape the fact that two-thirds of the European budget goes to the structural funds, which you can relate a little bit to competitiveness, 
to the agriculture uh, sector, which of course you can also relate a little bit to the uh, competitiveness issue. But of course, some review of how these funds are actually used uh, and against the background of the needed competitiveness is of course, I think, over time. We, we really need to do that. We need to be as courageous enough as to look at uh, not only uh, take two thirds, two thirds of the budget that is out of discussion. No, let's discuss the whole thing. Also, that will be politically very difficult, but I think we've come at a point where uh, there's no more escaping the fact that we need to do some things. And more in generally, uh, what I fear a little bit is that with all good intentions, we will start distributing subsidies and not having enough conditions attached to it. Uh, you were all aware of the decision by BASF to do an important uh, uh, investment in the United States. Other companies are making the same move. I read this morning in the Financial Times that Shell was contemplating to go to the United States. These are important signals. We should not ignore them. And it is very good and very essential that we stimulate research and development, but we should also uh, be able to keep the, the real thing, the production and, and all the activity here. And uh, we need to get to um, instruments that link the two more closely than they are today. And I think that's a challenge for all of us also certainly for the presidency, and uh, I'm happy to be here at the EIB. I think we should uh, take full advantage of the experience built up by the EIB by uh, not only taking the initiative to certain developments, but also getting the private sector involved in it. I think that's crucial if we want to, uh, to succeed in that huge competitive battle that is building up now Europe, the United States, China, you're all aware of it. I don't have to go into the details. But I think that's a really important issue that tends to be a little bit forgotten. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Johan, also to mention EIB. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, coming back later. Uh, if I may, Christian, uh, one of, of uh, the, the proposals that were already on the table is that sovereignty fund. Uh, it was launched by... Uh, by um, the president of the European Council, also Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, what is now um, the situation with that idea of sovereignty fund and what is your opinion about that? Well, we have, you're right, it was launched I think in September in the, in the statement of, um, of um, Ursula von der Leyen. Um, I think it's not, uh, it's not the sort of 100% enthusiast from member states on that one. Uh, all across the board. And uh, I think the argument that is coming up is um, uh, the first question is, do we need it? And, uh, and I think many would argue that uh, there are substantive funds within the system today. Uh, we have the next generation EU, which is substantial, which has not been used for, for uh, completely, on the contrary. We have other instruments as well which are out there and I think there is a sense among member states, I would say, to say that let us first see how we can use the funds that we have to our disposal before we are entering into a discussion about something which uh, probably will be quite divisive in discussions between, between member states but also possibly in the, in the discussions with, with the European Parliament. So I think that's a bit where, where member states are right now. Uh, we have noted that the Commission intends to present this proposal and uh, once it's presented, of course, then it is on the table and then we'll see how it's going to develop. Uh, a question for you, Johan. Uh, there was already a discussion in the European Parliament when I, I been well informed and most of the cases that is the case, but uh, you never know, um, that uh, this resolution was also um, uh, about the sovereignty fund, and I was informed that you uh, vote against that. that that's correct? That's can correct, you? yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank I, you. I still stand by that. <laughs> <laughs> but can you explain a little bit more why you are a, a, against uh, this uh, ID? Well, it's a little bit of a com uh, combination of what I said earlier and, and what was said by the Swedish presidency. Uh, I think at this point in time it is quite divisive uh, in, in among the member states, so 
watch out if you push with something like that because then you can get into, we all know this very well, into political situation where everything gets blocked because every move uh, brings about a counter move. That's one thing. But for me, the basic thing from what I know about it now is it's uh, just to jump to the conclusion and let me then explain if, if you want in, in two minutes. It, it's too dirigist. And it, I think it's not by coincidence that it is uh, mostly coming out of the brain trust of uh, Commissioner Breton. Uh, it, it, it is very much focused on we will choose, we will decide, we will choose the projects and the directions in, we, we, in which we have to go. And of course, of course, the, the, the state, whether it's at the national level or the European level, has a role to play there. But I repeat my, uh, my earlier call for uh, get, a, get the private sector involved and at, at a sufficiently early stage and with sufficiently uh, broad lines in terms of keep your options open. We're all today full of electrical cars uh, as, as the future. If I talk to, when I talk to scientists, I, I, I get a little bit of an uneasy feeling, aren't we putting too much of our eggs in this one basket? I have nothing against electric cars, far from it. They are certainly part of the future. But there are other things that also should get their chance to be further developed. And that's why I'm a little bit resistant, to put it politely, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, initiatives that are too dirigist, to use the French word. And that was basically, uh, my dear colleague, uh, or former colleague, uh, why I, w I voted against it. <laughs> okay, that's, that's very clear. Uh, if I may uh, ask you another question and then I shall come to, to you. Uh, what can be, in your opinion, the role of the EIB, EIB group in, 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 in this uh, discussion about competitiveness uh, and so on? Uh, do you have there some ideas for us or ideas uh, to court? Well, I think the, the, you, you already have that role and you are playing that role. Uh, we have seen in the country where I come from how EIB has been instrumental in order to get uh, investments going in uh, in areas such as uh, mega battery um, 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 factories, or for that day, for that day, for that sake, also in the, in certain textile factories for the future, and other sort of clean clean tech industries. Now, that textile one is a clean tech industry, by the way, so it should be clear on that one. So you 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 play a very important role there, and you you um, also under these circumstances that we have today, with the challenges we have, EIB can be not only mobilizing private capital for investments that otherwise wouldn't take place, but also see to that uh, the private sector is, is moving forward. And, uh, and, uh, and that, that, uh, that is essential. And that's why I think when we look on, on issues such as how we can come in and, and get clean tech moving, for example, for example uh, we believe that uh, EIB uh, and the market orientation that is there is going to be important. Uh, mm -hmm. for us to, to take on the challenges we've had. So EIB is going to be very important in my view. Thank you. Johan, you have also an opinion about what can or must be our role? Well, I don't have very much to add to what was just said because uh, the track record of the EIB is, uh, is quite excellent. Uh, and I think we should also very well consider what uh, image we give to the outside world when we have a, a, a well-run European institution that is that maybe I'm not saying is going to happen is left out of certain important developments that that would be kind of at least a little bit strange and if you allow it's not directly uh, related to competitiveness but for example with the huge uh, issue of the uh, Ukrainian reconstruction that we will have to do Absolutely. at one point uh, there, the EIB has experience. It has been very much uh, present in Ukraine. So I, I really would not understand uh, if, if, if the EIB would not be very much present in that endeavor that we will have to do. Uh, so uh, yes, please, play a role, get the private sector involved and uh, do what you, are, uh, what you have been shown to be good at. Okay, thank you. Perhaps uh, we can try for the first time going to the audience, to you, uh, if you have some questions for the distinguished guests for the moment. Um, 
Yes, there they are coming with a mic, I think. There, please. They are coming. Wait one one moment. Okay, Hello. please. Yeah, hi. I, I had a chat with you earlier, um, and I, I just have a question to the panel. Um, is is the Europe I mean, the European Union and the European business community is looking to balance the competitiveness of European manufacturing? So China has been the the or Asia has been the provider of of outsourced services and outsourced manufacturing. The U.S. has woken up with IRA and saying, like, well, we just don't like that that much. We're very proud of doing it in the U.S. And the and, uh, European Union uh, will now probably respond with the IRA response measures and, and Critical Mineral Act and all that things to bring manufacturing back to Europe. The question I have is, is Europe, that has spent many, many years on balancing Europe um, internally, uh, ready to take on these kind of external balances and, and, and commit themselves again to more manufacturing. I'm not denying that Europe cannot manufacture. We, we have proven this, but are we hungry enough to go back and roll up the sleeves and really get into it? Thank you for this question. Perhaps we can take a, another question, if there is another question, of course. I have a lot of questions, but please, here in the front. Thank you very much. My name is Hugo Beerkout from Netherlands, uh, a member of the Dutch Opera House, where I cover uh, sustainability and, uh, and energy affairs, um, amongst others. And I would like to ask the gentleman from Sweden, how are you looking at uh, biomass, uh, as you were very vocal about biodiversity, which is indeed very important. But also, uh, we worry a bit about chopping forests uh, and burn them for energy. How are you looking at, at, this, at this kind of uh, energy at the moment? That's my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think the last question is for you. And the first question I can uh, ask Johan. But we start with Sweden, if it's we okay. start with the forest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 28 million hectares, that's the forest in Sweden. Uh, we have been uh, doing forestry since, in a serious way, over the last 100 years. I can assure you that uh, we are very keen to look after the forest that we have. Uh, it's in our genes. Now, um, when it comes to biomass, uh, this has become a very important part of uh, our heating system. Uh, it is. Uh, dominant when it comes to our central heating. Now, there is a misunderstanding. We are, not, uh, we are not burning trees. We are burning what remains of the tree when all the rest have been used for building houses, for making furniture, for making paper, according to what is called the cascade principle. So the choice would have been to let that stay in the forest or to use it as biomass for heating. We have taken the choice that is used for biomass for heating. And uh, that has been essential, given the fact that here is a circular structure. We are planting more trees every year than the ones that we are cutting. And those trees are growing, and they are the ones that then are absorbing CO2. That's the way that we are addressing the Paris Protocol. That's the way that we are moving towards a fossil-free society. And that's why the whole issue of biomass is so essential for us. And we hope that there is an understanding within the rest of the collective of member states of this, particular, of this particular importance. Thank you, Christian. For the other question, Johan, you can yes. answer. I think uh, a very intriguing question because, uh, of course, the link uh, between, on the one hand, uh, research and development, innovation and manufacturing, as the speaker was emphasizing, is obvious. And I think there, and now I have to be very careful in my wording, we, we have to find a kind of new equilibrium between on the one hand, the, the climate and ecological issues that, of course, are very important, and the economic, manufacturing, industrial issues. Because separating uh, R&D innovation on the one hand from manufacturing on the other hand does not work. You will need both of them. And, of course, for all good reasons, we've been very much emphasizing climate goals and CO2 reductions. But 
what I see happening in the world is that uh, others are less eager, whatever the rhetoric, to follow in that lead that Europe is taking. I'm not saying that we should leave that lead, but we should be realistic about it. And I think some, like I said, uh, re-equilibrating of the thinking on what we have to do and what we need to do in order to get modern manufacturing also in Europe is something that will be essential in, in a re relatively short time period because, uh, like I said in my earlier intervention, uh, it does not help to be the only one to really being in fifth speed in terms of CO2 reduction while the others are not following and in the meantime you, uh, you destroy part of your economy. A kind of recalibration is needed there then. And I'm not denying the need for climate uh, measures, far from it, but I think we underestimated uh, the economic cost if we go it alone, which today is more or less happening. More or less. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Do you want to add something uh, about that question and the reaction? Uh, uh, maybe just to say that uh, manufacturing clearly is important, but what is also important is that we go into these uh, new areas uh, Artificial intelligence uh, data is going to be essential for the future and the whole digital economy. And, and that's why the issue of competitiveness in the broad sense, as I described, is so essential. We must see to it that our regulations, which are important for regulating issues that are essential for us, are done in such a way that we also can see a development of those particular areas together with manufacturing. Okay, uh, thank you. I think we have time for one or two Last questions, please. Uh, yeah, you, you are uh, well known because you have asked questions yesterday and today. This is uh, very active. Yeah, fine. That I don't know, but uh, we can examine that. But please. Uh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a, a challenging question. Uh, I would like to ask the two gentlemen, the three gentlemen, actually, if I may. What do you think is wrong? with the European growth model, and what do you think we can fix in the next years, not just through politics and, and uh, carrots, but also through the sticks that the EU institutions have. So in short, the European growth model, what's wrong with it, and if we can fix it. Okay, thank you. We have four minutes still to go. Uh, you are thinking, thinking. Uh, Johan, I can give you the floor. Well, the European growth model is, of course, a, a huge uh, item. One of the first things I will think about, and, and my former colleague will certainly immediately recognize it, we, we need to get to more employment. The employment rate in Europe should be higher, practically across the board. Uh, that has to do with labor costs, that has to do with the uh, investment climate, that has to do with the social security system. Another thing that uh, the European uh, growth model should certainly more emphasize is, uh, again, like I, or, like I already said, the, the importance of the private investment climate, where Europe has an important role to play. Uh, first of all, the single market, that companies can look at Europe as a whole when they are deciding upon investments. And I think there's uh, a huge task for the present generation of European decision makers that we keep the young European uh, market intact. Uh, that has a lot of consequences for state aid rules and other things. So that, that would be my two basic issues at this point in time with all the initiatives we have uh, already running in terms of climate and other issues. Thank you. Christian, please. Well, I agree. And I, if I take two additional elements, and I wouldn't say what's wrong, but rather what are the challenges in order for the growth model to deliver what we would like to see. And I would add skills as being immensely important. And then I would like to add also the digital transformation in terms of us, the take up of the digital in a broader sense. I think that's going to be immensely important for, the, for, the econo for, for our prosperity in the future. Yeah. Unfortunately, time is uh, running and we have uh, still two minutes uh, to go. Uh, when there are no other questions for the moment, 
I think what we have learned uh, with this uh, debate is uh, competitiveness is uh, on the agenda not only of the Swedish um, presidency but also in the European Parliament that I've understood that this sovereignty fund is not yet uh, decided and there will be a lot of discussions not only uh, in the European Council but also in the European Parliament uh, before having this kind of fund that uh, for sure I'm very pleased, of course, that uh, uh, the two uh, guests underlined the importance of the EIB and we shall play our role, uh, uh, of course, uh, in, in the future to make the competitiveness of uh, the companies in, in Europe uh, better than ever before with the support of the European Parliament and, of course, of the presidency. And um, now I think that I can thank the two uh, panelists uh, for being here and for this debate. I can uh, thank you, of course, uh, to be here to the, the end uh, of this uh, forum, but it's not to me to close the forum. That is someone, someone else. Uh, I give back the floor to, uh, to the speaker, uh, please, uh, and thank you for your attention.